I want to begin by paying tribute to Jamie Kabler. I've been going to this now for a number of years. It gets better every year, and it was fantastic to start with. Uh, as a writer, there are not many, in fact, there are very few gatherings like this, and not one is as good. And it's not just the quality of the authors that you're attracting, I mean, the quality is astounding. But it's actually the quality of the audience that you're attracting and what it means to us as writers to have the opportunity to encounter our real audience. Our real audience aren't the people who are commenting on my columns who clearly have too much time on their hands. <laughs> no, but real, real readers who are deeply engaged with the life of ideas and the life of imagination, uh, without which uh, free societies uh, can't survive. And all of this is on account of the enterprise and imagination and initiative of Jamie and a very small number of people who are by his side as uh, philanthropists or on your incredible staff who've made us all feel incredibly welcome. So thank you, Jamie. I mean, it's really... Um, I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about um, our moment, this moment in uh, global history. I think it's important when you have some sense of history to, to locate yourself and to find uh, appropriate parallels. Because when, when you're living through a specific point in history, it's easy to see the differences um, with other, other moments. It's important also to try to look at some of the similarities. So I would begin by proposing that now, February 3rd, 2023, is analogous to the 18th of June of 1940. On the 16th of June, two days before the 18th, on the 16th of June, France collapsed and sought terms, an armistice, with the, the German army, which had invaded uh, a little more than five weeks before on, on the 10th of May. Britain had just been able to bring out its forces from Dunkirk, and then, and then soon thereafter, uh, France fell, the Vichy regime, uh, the Vichy regime began. And it was on the 18th of June that Winston Churchill gave one of his great parliamentary uh, speeches, which has this incredible peroration that I know by heart, but I don't want to get a single word wrong, so I jotted it down. This is what he said. What General Vagon, referring to a French general, what General Vagon call, has called the Battle of France is over. I expect the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. A wonderful phrase, broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. And then he concludes, let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Now, why do I, why do I think this is the moment? We are not Britain in 1940 here in the United States. 
Ukraine is Britain in 1940. Volodymyr Zelensky is the Churchill of our time, and he has single-handedly mobilized his people to stand up to a tyrant and a tyranny which aims to sink us into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and more protracted by the lights of perverted science. The surveillance states that are being perfected in Moscow and also being perfected in places like Beijing and Tehran. And he is fighting this battle almost single-handedly, almost single-handedly with just enough assistance to fend off a, a, a tyrant who aims to wipe Ukraine off the map of the world. The United States is America in June of 1940. And where was America in June of 1940? We were just emerging from a national trauma, the likes of which we had barely experienced before, which was the Great Depression. We were emerging, uncertainly, from a long period of isolationism that had come about because of our experience, our bitter uh, experience of the previous war, the First World War, which we thought we had gone to fight for the principles of democracy and freedom and turned out, in many ways, to just be an enterprise in empires struggling against one, uh, one another. That was America in June of 1940. We, too, are emerging from a period of disillusion about foreign engagement and a period of trauma over the last two and a half, three years of the pandemic. And so we find ourselves, as Americans did in June of 1940, suddenly trying to reorient ourselves to a world which doesn't quite fit the world we thought we were moving towards, doesn't quite fit the needs we think we have as a nation, divides us, not just on, across uh, or between parties, but divides us within parties, between isolationists in the Republican side, isolationists on, on the Democratic side. And so we're a country that's trying to take stock and trying to figure out what to do and what the future may hold for us, not just in terms of what's happening in Ukraine, but what also may soon be happening as early as 2025, according to a four-star general, um, across the Straits of, uh, of, of uh, Taiwan. What soon may, happen, may be happening, given the fact that according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, which tries to monitor this stuff, Iran is within weeks of acquiring four to five bombs worth of uh, fissile, uh, fissile material. This is, this is the moment that we're in. So let me talk a little bit about how we got into this moment and then try to handicap the field. How did we get into this moment? I grew up during the final phases of the Cold War. I was in college when I watched the Soviet Red Banner come down over the Kremlin and be replaced by the blue, white, and red of the Russian Federation's flag, which unbelievably at the time seemed, given what happened afterwards, seemed like this hopeful moment, the end of Soviet communism. When I grew up, it was common for people to understand the world in the following, with the following dichotomy, the free and the unfree world. Now, it's absolutely true that the free world wasn't free everywhere, that the term was imprecise, that within the free world, we were denying freedom to people who deserved it. And it was true that the unfree world wasn't entirely monochromatic either. But broadly speaking, most of us understood that that division was real, that it had its geographic locations in places like Berlin at the wall, or in Panmunjom along the 38th parallel of, of, uh, of the Korean Peninsula, and that it meaningfully separated two very different kinds of political systems, one of which you very much wanted to live in and make better, the other, the other one you wanted to, 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 to flee, um, sometimes by running through Macy's, if any of you saw that wonderful movie, Moscow and the Hudson with, with, uh, with Robin Williams. So that was the division of the world, the free and the unfree world. It was a political division. 
It was a moral division. It was a philosophical division. And then 1991 comes along. The Soviet Union collapses. We convince ourselves that we've reached the end of history. And there's a new division that becomes common to our parlance. We don't talk about the free and the unfree world. We talk about the developed and the developing world. And you should stop and think about what that transition means. Because free and unfree is an opposition. Developed and developing is a continuum. All countries, in a sense, are on the path towards development. And development is an economic concept. And the conceit buried within the idea of the developed or the developing world is that so long as countries continue to make economic progress, so long as they move up the ladder in terms of gross domestic product per capita, eventually that wealth will translate into greater degrees of political freedom. So the assumption that we made when we began to engage with China in the 1990s, 1980s and 1990s, and when we brought China into the World Trade Organization in, uh, I think, 1997, 1998, was, well, it doesn't really matter that it's a tyranny. It doesn't really matter that they massacred students in Tiananmen Square. Because eventually, once they reach the point of, say, GDP per capita of, say, $10,000 per person, China will by itself become free because middle class people will demand, demand greater political uh, liberties and, and the regime is going to open up. So what should we do? We should pump money into China. We should pump investment into China. We should pump technology into China because eventually all of this is going to work out just fine. Richer China is a better China and a better China is good for the rest of the world. We did this in Russia as well. Germany and other European states uh, were the ones that fell most for this idea. Well, if you just trade with Vladimir Putin, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, Anna Politkovskaya gets killed in the elevator. Another journalist gets thrown out of, uh, thrown out of a window. Uh, other dissidents, Boris Nemtsov, gets shot down along the walls of, of the Kremlin. Russia feels less and less free. But it's OK, because if we are trading with Russia, if they are selling us their energy and we are giving us our dollars or our, or our euros, things with Russia are going to be OK, because it's a developing country. So let's develop it further. We did the same thing with Iran. This idea that we had of a developed and a developing world was one of those intellectual conceits which helps explain how we got to the moment that we're in. We didn't make our enemies freer and more like us. We made them richer and more capable of opposing us and potentially destroying us. And that's the moment we're, we're, we're in now. For the first time since 1940, the United States faces not one major foreign adversary, but potentially, well, definitely two major foreign adversaries and a third foreign adversary that, that worries us as well, just as Italy uh, Germany and, and uh, imperialist Japan did on the eve of the Second World War. That's the moment that we're in. So how do we begin to uh, think about how it might turn out? What are our strengths and our weaknesses? And what are their strengths uh, and their weaknesses? And how is it going to suss out? Um, my daughter and I went to go see uh, the new Top Gun movie, which I assume all of you have watched many times. Um, many times. Um, there's a scene in the new Top Gun film where uh, Maverick, the Tom Cruise character, and the son of his former uh, radio officer are engaged in this furious kind of air uh, play. I don't, I don't know what the term of art is. But they find themselves sort of spinning at a high rate of speed towards a mountainside. And one of them has to pull up, uh, or, 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 or they're both going to go crashing into the mountain. When I think of the conflict between the free and unfree world, I think of those two planes spiraling down. We are not just in a contest of strength with our adversaries. We're actually in a contest of weakness. So what are those, what are those key weaknesses? I think it's important for us to think about them, because if we can identify them correctly, 
we can start perhaps correcting ours and aggravating theirs. So what's the great key weakness of every democracy? The great Chinese bet, the bet that Xi Jinping is making for the long-term emergence of China as the world's dominant power is this, that all democracies, all free societies eventually vote themselves into bankruptcy because a free society can vote itself benefits by borrowing against the future to feed the needs and demands and desires of the present. Ultimately, all of these societies will become highly indebted societies, and at the moment that inflation kicks in, our ability to service our debts becomes uh, much more strained. Our ability to fund national priorities like defense becomes much, much weaker. And so democracies in the eyes of a dictator are degenerate because we're not looking out for the future, we're looking out for the present at the expense of the future. There is, a, dic a dictator will say, inherent anti-dynamism in free societies, which is why our growth figures have been so lackluster in the past, in the past 20 years because it's where our, our investment is not going into labor and, and uh, innovation and work, it's going into entitlements. That's true. Now on the other side, dictatorships have, another, have a, a very different kind of problem. In a dictatorship, your ability to innovate depends on the amount of freedom that's in society to ask questions, not just uh, political questions, but technical, scientific questions that others hadn't thought of before. But any unfree society has to limit that ambit, that the, the ambit of people's minds to say you can only devote yourself to certain kinds of tasks. It's why China, even today, with all of the effort to innovate, is unable to build a commercial airliner. China cannot yet build a regular Boeing 737 or an, or, or an, uh, an Airbus jet. What can they do? They can send spies abroad to steal commercial trade secrets, and they do that at an astonishing rate. But the lack of innovation is a fatal weakness in any unfree society. So free societies lack dynamism. Unfree societies lack that, um, that sense of innovation. Second key set of weakness, weaknesses. Free societies suffer from too much information. Too much information. There was a political scientist named Roberta Wolstetter who many years ago wrote a book about how we were surprised at Pearl Harbor. And, you know, because there was, in fact, abundant information that Japan might strike our, our battle fleet uh, in Pearl Harbor. And that spawned a number of conspiracy theories about FDR, that he wanted it to happen in order to give the United States an excuse to go to war. And Wallstetter actually said something much more interesting. She said, yeah, we knew that the Japanese might attack Pearl Harbor, but we also knew that they might attack Panama. And we thought they could attack the Philippines, and we thought they might attack Alaska. And so because there was so much noise, there was so much information, we were unable to find the signal within the noise. The superabundance of information was almost as bad as no information because it was hard to distinguish significant from insignificant information. That is our problem today. We are inundated with data. We are inundated with points of information and it is becoming increasingly hard for any of us to figure out, well, what is it that matters and what is simply noise. This is a really deep problem with democracies, a deep problem also with the media, in that typically when those of us who are in the media say this is significant information, sometimes it's not. Quite often it's not. You look at the record of media mistakes going back 25, 35 years. I don't know if any of you remember how Japan was gonna take over the world, other sorts of uh, um, absurd propositions that were bandied about in the media. That's because we had too much information. What is the problem with dictatorships? Not enough information. Not enough information. If you want to arrange, if you want to have a society that functions well and that avoids crises, 
the quantity of necessary information and the quantity of available information have to more or less match up. How did we get a panic in 2008, right, with the mortgage-backed securities? We panicked because the amount of information that the markets needed for that moment wasn't there. We didn't know how much these mortgage-backed, what, what the liabilities for these mortgage-backed securities uh, was. So everyone sold. So there was this massive panic. That's what happens when available information and necessary information don't match up. That is a continuous problem in all, all unfree societies. Even the rulers don't know what's true. And that's compounded by the fact that in an unfree society, every provincial governor is lying to the guy above him, and the guy above him is lying to the Politburo in Beijing, and the Politburo in Beijing is lying, uh, lying to the top guy. How did Russia get surprised about, what, about the fate of its army in Ukraine uh, a year ago? Vladimir Putin thought he had a great army. Nobody had told him that his generals had siphoned off billions of dollars to buy homes in, in, in the south of France, and that he was, going, he was going to war with a Potemkin army. Problem of a lack of information. Third, third fundamental flaw in free societies and then unfree societies. In free societies, liberalism, and I mean liberalism in the broad sense, freedom, has a way of turning on itself. We are societies that ask questions of ourselves. We interrogate our history. We interrogate our society. We ask, what are, our, what are the injustices? What's, what's going wrong? And in many ways, that's extraordinarily healthy. But it becomes unhealthy when we become self-loathing societies. It becomes unhealthy when we believe that we're not a democracy, we're a deep state regime that is secretly pulling the strings and trying to um, harm the little guy at the expense of the Davos crowd. We're an unhealthy society when we say that the foundation of this country was not 1776, when we married a political principle uh, to a philosophical principle that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And we say to ourselves that no, our foundation was 1619 and the history of America is nothing except a history of white supremacy, racism, oppression, and deceit uh, covered up by hypocritical lies in the Declaration of Independence. Societies that despise themselves, that see no reason to perpetuate their own institutions, see no goodness in what has come before, even if it was imperfect, are societies that are on the road to self-destruction. You need patriotism, you need pride, even if it's a self-critical patriotism and pride in order to, in, in, in order to persevere. What is the parallel uh, failure of unfree societies? Unfree societies can tell you what the curriculum is, can command patriotism, can command obedience, but the one thing they cannot command is loyalty. You can command obedience, you can get soldiers to go where they're told, but you can't really get them to fight for things they believe in, in their hearts are true and necessary for their families and their livelihoods and their futures. That explains why in Ukraine, a country which had, by the way, no sense of, of obedience, right, that this state, as corrupt as it was on the surface, had this core, a loyalty to the principles of an open and free society which explains why Ukraine fights and why Russian soldiers, sadly for them, are cannon fodder in, in, in Putin's army. So that is the, the next contest. Will we hate ourselves to the point that we're unable to stand for our principles, stand for what we believe in, or, or matched up against unfree societies that can send soldiers into war with bayonets at their backs, not at their, at their, at their front, but ultimately cannot command any deep sense of loyalty. Two more points I want, to make, uh, I want to mention. When free societies face economic or other internal social challenges, they become isolationist. That's what happened to the United States in the 1920s and in the 1930s. People forget that in his first six years in office, FDR was an isolationist president didn't want to get the United States 
involved in the problems of the war. It was only around 37, 38 that he started to turn, and he turned slowly. People looking at the Biden administration wondering why is he not acting faster should look at that parallel with Franklin Roosevelt. It was not a rapid turn to, to, uh, uh, to engagement. Isolationist societies pretend that if we turn our back or if they turn their back on the world, the world will turn their back on them. That's not how it works out. On the other hand, unfree societies, when they run into domestic problems, become aggressive. When Argentina was suffering hyperinflation, what did it do? It invaded the Falklands. When Saddam Hussein went bankrupt after the Iran-Iraq war, what did he do? He invaded Kuwait. Some of you may have seen the news last month that China is now in demographic decline, and demographic decline almost always means economic decline. People should be worried about this, because when a nation like China experiences these sorts of declines, when it can no longer uh, assuage or buy off its people in the coin of economic growth, it is going to turn to external aggression. And sometimes that succeeds, and sometimes that fails. And the final point I want to make, we have a real problem in the United States, we have a real problem throughout the West with competent leadership. Um, we have not had a truly great president for a long, long time. Uh, and it's not happening simply at the level of the presidency or the vice presidency, it's happening layers and layers down. We find, with the exception of the city of Rancho Mirage, <laughs> with the exception of the city of Rancho Mirage, we find that the people who ought to be in government don't want to go into government. The people who ought to be leading us have too many incentives or disincentives, and so they stay away. They're in other professions. There are a lot of fantastic people in the United States, and you ask yourself, why aren't you in public service? And then you stop and think and say, oh yeah, because you don't want every stone uh, uh, in your life turned over to look for worms, or you don't want to put your family through uh, uh, the ringer, or you don't want to go broke for the next several years of your, uh, of your life and not being able to afford tuition for your children because public service is so ill-paid. Competency in leadership is a real problem throughout democracies. And that's, that's something that, that, needs to be, that needs to be addressed. On the other hand, it turns out that being a competent dictator is a hard thing to do as well. It's not easy to be a dictator. Because to be a good dictator, you need to have enough repression, right, to keep people in line, but not so much repression that you're giving them uh, incentives to overthrow your government. What happened in Iran in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, six months? The Iranian regime was so repressive that it handed every single woman in that society the instrument of her own liberation. All of those extraordinarily courageous women taking off their hijabs, all they have to do is take off the hijab and they're committing a revolutionary act. Now, the additional ingredient is courage, the likes of which simply take, should take our breath away, right? But it was such a repressive regime that it handed the people a sword, and that's what's happening now. So here we are in this contest of the free and the unfree world, and it's a question about whose weaknesses will ultimately weigh more heavily on each world than the, than, than, than the other, other side's weaknesses. I would just want to propose a few thoughts about how we, how we move forward. The first thing is, as never before, I think, in my lifetime, the outcome of the battle in Ukraine is essential to the battle for the free world. That is why I began by reading Churchill's finest hour speech. If Ukraine falls and there are reports that Putin is amassing upwards of 500,000 troops on the border for a renewed offensive, probably to begin the 24th of February, it's not only Ukraine that will suffer and Putin that will profit, but Xi Jinping in Japan will take the lesson, strike now, strike or, 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 or strike very soon. You may, pay a, you may pay a heavy price, but better do it sooner than when we've had a, more of an opportunity to arm Taiwan. The dictators in Iran will also take the lesson, 
move quickly towards a nuclear capability. And once they do that, the Saudis will be a nuclear, nuclear power and the Turks will be a nuclear power and we're going to be off to the races. So much depends on the outcome of this battle that so far we are helping Ukraine wage with so much ambivalence. We need for once to be all in and we need a president we need the president to do more than just help Ukraine at the last minute. He needs, and his, the officers of his government, need to go around the country to Columbus, Ohio, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and, and Spokane, Washington, and say, this is why this matters to you. What happens in Ukraine isn't some distant battle at the far edge of the world. If Ukraine falls, Europe is going to be next. Taiwan is going to be next. You're not going to be able to have a car with, uh, 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 with, with semiconductors in it, with chips in it, and it's going to destroy our economy for the next 10 years, not to mention destroy our world. So we need, in addition to helping Ukraine, a pedagogy of freedom. We need a president explaining why this matters. The second thing that we need to do is we need to revive, in the broadest sense, the traditions of a liberal, open, tolerant society. That's being attenuated on both sides of the, political, uh, of the political spectrum. We need to find a way to teach younger people what the habits of a free mind are. And right now, our high schools aren't doing it, and our colleges aren't doing it. We need to teach the virtue of curiosity, not contempt. We need to teach the virtue of listening, listening, not just lecturing. We need to understand that all of life is a series of miscues and mistakes and, uh, and, and, and people who are misspeaking and saying the wrong thing, and that's not an opportunity to damn them and condemn them. It's an opportunity to engage with them, make life in a free society tolerable again. That's what we need, what we need to do. And if the current, current universities can't do this, some of you in this room have to start figuring out how to create new institutions, new places where dialogue um, uh, can happen between reasonably open-minded people. And the last, thing I, the last thing I wanna say, and this goes to what you're doing here, uh, Jamie. We have a problem with literacy at every level in our society. And it's, it, in some cases, it's actual literacy. Some astonishing percentage of Americans can't read above a sixth grade level. But even among people who can, how often, how many times a year are they reading a book? How much of their time is spent wondering about the past? How are they activating their human imagination by engaging with great literature, which teaches you that people are complex and that complex people can rise above their personalities and their defects uh, and their insecurities and accomplish great things. And that's not, that, that culture is not what it used to be. It's not what it used to be. We've denuded the American imagination about the possibilities of human beings to be better citizens and of nations to be greater nations. How do you restore that? You restore that through a vibrant, active, profound literary culture. It's so important to the survival of a free society. And I'm looking at this room, there may be 100 or so people uh, in this room, maybe another 200, 300 who are coming in. You guys are the little platoons that accomplish those tasks. So thank you for coming to this. Thank you for participating in an incredible national endeavor. All of this happening improbably in this faraway desert, uh, which is such a nice place to spend a winter's weekend or winter's weekend. Thank you so much.